You know, because deep down he's a vulgar, pub-dwelling dimwit with insatiable appetites skyrocketing into monolithic celebrity. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Delicious. Great to see you. How's it going? Today is Money, a suicide note, a dark comedic novel by the English author Martin Amis. This is the first book of his I've read, published in 1984, and I believe was uh, uh, the first big success for him. Martin Amis, uh, tragically in the past tense, uh, as of May last month, rest in peace, uh, was a terrific author, originally from Oxford, England. At the end of his days, though, as it turns out, he was, a, he was actually a fellow Floridian uh, over there in Lake Worth, Florida, about an hour north of Miami. His father was the British author uh, Kingsley Amos, who I've never read, but he wrote a book that he's very famous for uh, called Lucky Jim. So this is a story about a man making a movie, a man named John Self. He's an unlikable protagonist. Um, I mean, he's really kind of disgusting. Yet somehow, too, uh, too self-aware and intelligent, somehow, to be entirely unlikable. Uh, you, <laughs> his intelligence is scarcely believable. It's really just because Martin Amos is writing him, you know. It's like, because a guy like this, you think, probably wouldn't have the kind of insights and reflections that he does in the book, which make the book. But uh, <laughs> it's just, you know. Anyways, he's an odd protagonist. You, you never, you don't really like him but you, sometimes you kind of do. The first thing uh, you might be reminded of when you start reading the book is uh, Fellini's Eight and a Half, uh, which is a which is an amazing film uh, starring the inimitable Marcello Mastriani, which is about a man making an enormous film, uh, chaotic, highly expensive film, the ultimate structure or meaning of which he has no idea while he's making it, all of it being based on his personal life, his very personal life, uh, which is like collapsing all around him. It's one of my favorite films. It's absolutely essential viewing. Uh, I've never made a feature-length film, but I have made shorts, and um, for, for, for whatever little directing experience I have, that's pretty much it, even though, you know, I wasn't working with people, uh, I wasn't working with stars or anything, like, you know, so it's like, but <laughs> imagine working with that much money and talent and and the deadlines and all of these people and all of these egos and all of this drama it's really it's really uh, it's really amazing that uh, any any films get made at all or or that they did back then at all it's a it's an insane industry it's like gambling plus like hustling plus like i don't know organized crime or some shit it's like we it's a very strange strange <laughs> strange industry now what is the polar opposite of that film and, and takes uh, near the number one spot on the list of highly unessential viewing would be the 1980 science fiction film Saturn 3 for which Amos was hired to write the script and this whole book is based off of that experience. The film stars a very aging Kirk Douglas and Harvey Keitel and uh, Farrah Fawcett. It was horrible. I mean like it was it was spectacularly bad. Uh, I could barely watch clips of it. It's it's so so bad. But something great came out of it, right? So Amos used his experience of uh, that disaster to fuel this novel. Characters in the book are partially based on real people involved with the film. So here we are, New York City, 1980, uh, 42nd Street, Wall Street, money, booze, money, pornography, money, fast food, money, 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 SpongeBob! Fall of Rome shit, but right before everybody at the party knows. All of this book is told from the first person POV of our director, John Self. He's a 35 year old director who grew up both in America and England, and now he's trying to make a very uh, lame sounding domestic drama about uh, a young man and an old man both in love with the same woman with an enormously inflated budget packed full of very famous, very um, neurotic and very egotistical movie stars with names such as Long Island, haha, -ha, Spunk Davis and Butch Beausoleil, Butch Beausoleil being a the bombshell of the film, it's actually a woman with the name Butch. The man responsible for funding this venture, this catastrophe, or gathering the funding, we're told, is a young, very obnoxiously healthy go-getting producer named Fielding Goodney. Yeah, Fielding, Fielding Goodney. <laughs> Who invites John into this world and is sort of emphatically cheering him on the whole time, you know? 
and supervises him behind the scenes through this carnival of excess, as they gather increasing investors and sign more talent to the film. God knows how. And he insists John spend more, right? Urging him to spend much, much more money. To put it exceedingly mildly, John self is a big fat grade A addict of just about everything it's possible to be addicted to, except for exercise. Alcohol, cigarettes, fast food, pornography, fighting, and money. It's almost endearing, you know, because it's, I mean, he's like a, he's like a kid in a candy store who's just unleashed, right? You know, because deep down he's a vulgar, pub-dwelling dimwit with insatiable appetites skyrocketing into monolithic celebrity. You know, I mean, it's like, he, he should never have been able to do this. It's grotesque and bewildering, but then again, the most ridiculous shit gets bankrolled, so it's like, huh. you kind of buy it, like, yeah, I guess this could kind of happen, huh? How he came to be in this position of power as a director seems to have stemmed from him directing commercials for junk food. Addicted to fast food himself, the novel is a relentless list of god-awful scenarios, which usually result in a kind of what appears to be like a perpetual hangover that lasts the length of the novel. By the end, everything just has this veneer of illness. Like, it's exhausting to read, it's exhausting to read about all of this excess. It's just gross, man. Back in London, his car, because he's going back and forth, you know, between cities, his car, the one that he drives in London, is a fiasco. Literally, that's the car model's name. And due to its incredibly unreliable nature, entirely appropriate. Another fiasco back at home is uh, his relationship with his girlfriend slash live-in prostitute, sort of, uh, Selena who a friend has told him is cheating on him right as he's entered the side of Heathrow you can't go back from to catch a flight to New York, right? So he's at the airport with his friend. He goes through, you know, the, the gate or wherever where, you know, you pass to the other side where you can't turn around, right? And right at that moment, his friend on the other side tells him that Selena's cheating on him. <laughs> it's such a dick move. He won't tell him who, but he, uh, he says that uh, he knows him, right? Meanwhile, back in New York, John Self is having an affair with a woman uh, who he is gradually falling in love with named Martina. But he makes a horrifying discovery, much to his deep, deep shame and frustration, and that is that he is not sexually attracted to her, and it's very hard for him. Or not. The good woman, you know, the one he truly loves, the one he knows is the correct partner for him, he doesn't physically desire. What do you do with that? Aside, that might be the first time I've actually come across that in a novel. That's pretty good writing. Yeah. And there's also, you know, there's, there's, there's more. There's much, much more. Uh, and, so, and in the middle of all of this, he is receiving these very strange phone calls from this stalker. This stalker manages to always get the number of whatever phone John is closest to, whether it's his hotel room or somewhere else, threatening him, telling him they'll meet one day, insinuating he'll get his revenge for having wronged him, right? He, he, John has slighted this stalker somehow, somewhere in the past, no idea who it is, no idea what it was that insulted him. What that wronging was, well, our guess is as good as John's. Regarding the writing itself, you know, it's odd because Amos is writing incredibly literate, concise, insightful sentences from the perspective of a man who is, is damn near illiterate. However, Martina, that woman he's, he's in love with, uh, gets him to read books such as uh, Animal Farm and, and Freud and others and such. Takes him to see a production of Othello and things like that. Introducing him to culture, right? But it's not enough. Culture is not enough to keep John Self. So he has to walk back and forth between John Self's inner meditative monologue of reflection, and, and this is more in like the last third of the novel, I think. But then back to his myopic observations about the outside world, his stupid observations. He has to he has to remain convincingly stupid while having these, you know, these insights, you know, provided by Amos, but through the voice in John Self's head, and then descriptions, you know, of his zany antics. Unfortunately, in this novel, the zany factor is heavy. I hate zany books. I, I do. I hate zany novels. Zany does not work for me. They never work for me. The only person who ever pulled it off, who I, who I enjoy reading, uh, who, could be who could be described as zany, would be Hunter S. Thompson. For sure. But I mean, his style was one entirely his own and, and like of breathtaking genius. I mean, it was, you know, and it was that newspaper thing, right? The, like, the brilliance about him was that it was crazy shit, but from a guy who was still like totally calm, like reporting back to you. It's like, and then this crazy shit happened. It's like his heart rate never goes up, right? Which is why that's, that's his whole style. It's brilliant. But zany or not, you know, I mean, Amos knocks it out of the park in several parts. So for me, you know, initially entertained by this bizarre setup, the bouts of drinking and fast food binging become ridiculously monotonous. 
And that is my major complaint with the novel. I mean, good Christ. I mean, there's like about a hundred pages of partying that could just be slashed from the book. You just don't need them. We got it, right? It wasn't until about three quarters in or so, two thirds, three quarters, where things really start falling to pieces that I began to see that Amos was a very serious, serious author, serious writer, very, very sharp. Especially considering he was my age around the time he wrote this, which is just, you know, further proof that generational intelligence is in precipitous decline, but what do I know? Haha. -ha. I mean, there are sentences in here that are the equivalent of watching a guy with an AR-15 just pile drive a bullseye full of lead. One breathtaking shot after another that you just feel in your chest. It's, there, there's stuff in here, you know, I, I've said it before, you know, writing is perfectly articulating what we can all recognize that we're thinking, but can't say, maybe because we're not allowed to, or maybe because it's just very difficult to kind of stop, synthesize, get the words right, get it down, put it on paper, reflect it back to you, and recognize it. Yeah, he, he's got it in spades. He was a terrific author. Amos could absolutely write. So while John Self is trying to squeeze the most out of life, it becomes pretty clear it's because he's aware of his eventual approaching death, right? Is he, he start, he's at that age where I am right now, where mortality is suddenly a factor, right? It hasn't suddenly been a factor for me. It's, been, it's bothered me for quite a bit. But, you know, the song in the back of your head is just increasingly louder every single year, right? And also he's got this heart condition, this ticker condition, as he puts it. So it's about the passing of time, you know, it's about age and aging. He's getting a rug rethink, like a haircut, a rug rethink. I went in for a rug rethink in Queensway this afternoon. 15 quid just for a feminine touch. That was all I was after. The smock chick fingered my hair and said in her stupid voice, You're receding. We all are, I said. We are all receding. Waving or beckoning or just kissing our fingertips, we are all fading, shrinking, paling. Life is all losing. We are all losing. Losing mother, father, youth, hair, looks, teeth, friends, lovers, shape, reason, life. We are losing, losing, losing. Take life away. It's too hard too difficult. We aren't any good at it. Try us out on something else. But shelve life. Take life off the stands. It's too fucking difficult and we aren't any good at it. So in the book, when he runs into some script problems, he hires a writer that he uh, has seen from time to time in his local neighborhood. A guy he's seen around who initially kind of gave him the creeps, but uh, he's met him a few times and they're kind of slowly becoming friendly. Uh, this writer named uh, Martin Amos. When Kingsley Amos read his son's novel, This One Money, at the point where Martin introduces himself as a character in the book, uh, apparently his dad, Kingsley, just like threw it up in the air uh, in disgust. Yet another great author with father issues, right? With dad issues. I think I've said that the best authors typically have that, so, yeah. So Martin Amos is a character in his own book. So, you know, so much of this seems like Welbeck, you know, and Welbeck wrote himself into The Map and the Territory. Great book. Um, you wonder if Welbeck hadn't read this and, uh, and, and, and kind of taken some notes, but uh, yeah. Of course, in the end, the bottom falls out from under John's self, and he realizes he doesn't know anything. Nothing is what it seems. Everything is a lie. What in God's name is actually going on, right? The film John is trying to make suddenly materializes in his own life, right? Or it was always there all along and we just discover it, I'm not sure. In terrible ways. Terrible, terrible, very humorous ways. It all starts when, after paying for a meal in a restaurant, the waiter delivers his vantage card back to him, cut into four pieces. Like somebody took scissors and just snipped, snipped the card, cut up the credit card. Well, that's kind of strange, isn't it? Why would anybody do that? So what is it all about, right? Money is about a man reckoning with the nature of love and sex, their difference, aging and death. But above all, of course, money. The strange omnipresent factor that dictates everything with no allegiance to human ethics, right? No allegiance to anything except for itself. It buys and sells itself. It procreates, it magnifies, it opens doors, it makes time. It is time. It moves worlds, it destroys and creates, it enslaves and frees. When you really start to think about money, it's kind of fucking crazy. The streets are full of movement, but hardly anybody goes where they go through thought or choice, free of money motive. Only people with money do that. But I am interested in what Amos is getting at, right? Which is that the obscene escalation of a machine with infinite funding is disturbing. The tone is very Wolf of Wall Street, total, total depravity, 
total shenanigans. As a commentary on the insanity of culture of the time, I'd say it definitely works, you know? So of course, the first literary comparison I drew uh, while reading this was the extremely popular American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis, which uh, uh, came out seven years later and takes place approximately seven years later as well. That's like mid to later 80s. This is 1980. Like American Psycho, money is a satire of the excesses of 1980s New York, but it's warmer than American Psycho, for sure. It's more concerned with ethics and morality. Ellis is more concerned with a kind of cold, chiseled style and nihilism. But because of this, I think money has a stronger narrative. Uh, it's more cohesive, even though it's a mess. But it's perhaps, interestingly, not a stronger novel. Um, I wouldn't say it is. I wouldn't say American Psycho is stronger than money, though. They're both very different. They're very similar in some ways. They're very different in other ways. They both have their strengths and weaknesses. They both suffer from being overwritten and zany. Yes, this zany thing again. It's interesting, both of these novels are disgusting, right? But American Psycho is so cold and psychotically polished, saved for certain horrific moments that are dropped in like drops of blood into a bowl of milk. Whereas money is covered in a, a rainbow of nauseating fluids right from the beginning. Uh, it's a spectacle. It's a shit show. Both have their strengths. Both are worth reading. One is not better than the other. Both capture uh, the absolute insanity of the 80s in New York, in America. It's wonderful. Better than food. Another similarity I found interesting. Uh, Brett Easton Ellis legitimately had like a, uh, a super creepy uh, female stalker for a period of time when he was living in New York, I think. I think I heard that on his podcast. I thought, oh, like, man, I had, like, had, living with that. As does John Self in the book, though, of course, his, his stalker is male. Uh, coincidental. It's weird, right? See, I hated this book in the middle. Hated it. Hated it. Hated it. Was tired of reading it. It just sagged. With the main character's consumption of horrific fast food and strippers and prostitutes and alcohol, I was nearly always asking, why is he writing about this again? How is this possibly interesting? I just thought, it's not that funny. The stupid names and the stupid jokes and the stupid, like, fast food names, ad nauseum and just like all this crap. I was just like, God. Get on with it! I chuckled once or twice, but I mean, even getting the humor, it just wasn't strong. It just wasn't... I, I really do think they should have fired the editor, whoever whoever edited this novel. I mean, really, he, you could have cut out large swaths of this thing, and it would have been infinitely better. But it turned out great, you know. It snapped back into shape as soon as Selena told him she's pregnant. And that buildup is such cutting, dark comedy. Holy shit. And again, same technique when uh, Selena's trying to steal John back from Martina. The you bet line, that is genius writing. <laughs> He's got a real knack for that punchline at the end. It was a slow burn. It just turned out to be a slow burn. It just, it, this happens sometimes. This just goes to show, if you start a book, finish it. You have to judge the book as a whole, right? It's only in the last third of this book when the character gets really, really interesting. For me, personally. So... Better than food, for sure. So you should read it. I say if you enjoy Brett Easton Ellis, Michelle Welbeck, Will Self, and Chuck Palahniuk, check it out. It's very dry, cutting, cynical, sardonic humor, uh, but it has a heart, you know? So, <clears throat> coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for stopping by and watching. I take all of the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show, and I place their names in this mason jar. And for every review, I pull out a name. And whoever's name is pulled out, they are sent a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee, roasted by yours truly. I roast coffee as a hobby, and it's delicious. Currently from Sumatra. Love that stuff. If you'd like to get in on that and help support the show, you can click on the link below, or go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food, and donate $5 or more per video. And I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much. For $1 or more, you'll get access to the patron-only reviews, the Discord channel, plus the Better Than Friday newsletter that I send out every Friday, which is just a list of five different things that I'm interested in at any given time. Could be books in the pipeline, articles, music, films, changes week to week. And there's many of those, and so there's a whole back catalog to sift through if you need some new music, books, or films. So, yeah. And international shipping is included. Thank you so much to all my patrons, and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Alex. Alex M. Thank you very much, Alex. Really appreciate it. You're going to receive money by Martin Amos, plus a bag of coffee, roast by yours truly, and I hope you love both. Thank you so much. Please subscribe if you have not already and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this. And always remember, bring a book wherever you go. This is just a little reposado. All I've got is a wine glass that so we'll have to do. To Martin Amos. Rest in peace. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. 
Okay. Ciao.